Hello, I'm Father Mitch Packle, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. First, I want to wish you a blessed celebration of this great solemnity of All Saints Day. This is a feast where we celebrate all the saints of the church, but that includes a celebration of all those saints who were never publicly canonized. So many of the members of the church died in the state of grace and went to heaven, and they are saints, but you know, we don't always know as much about each individual, uh, but our Lord does. Just like he knows every hair on your head and he knows every sparrow out in the uh, sky, he knows every flower in the field, he also knows each one of us with infinite intimacy and they get to see him face to face. And we celebrate this to make sure that we also set our hearts on becoming one of the saints too. So that's a great celebration today. Our guest tonight is not a saint yet, he's still alive, he's working on it though. He is uh, an author, he's been a speaker and a pilgrimage leader. He has led many groups to the Holy Land and to other Christian holy sites all around the world. He's put his knowledge and experience to paper in a brand new commentary on the book of Genesis, in which he describes that first book of the Bible as a shout of joy, because it lets us know where we came from, who we are, and what our destiny is. So please welcome the author of Genesis, a Bible study guide and commentary, Mr. Steve Ray. Steve, welcome back. Thank it's you, been Father. A while. It has been a while. Oh, you I haven't know, changed one bit since I was here last time. I know so many people were hoping that I would change, but <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Yeah. That's the way life goes. So, <laughs> at any rate, uh, it's good to see you here. Thank Welcome you. very much. Thank you. And um, I know you've changed. You've gotten 20 grandkids along the last few years. 20 grandkids and new knees. New knees. Titanium. See? So we're dealing with new and used parts here. <laughs> That's right. That's... <laughs> My dad was a car salesman. So, <laughs> so in addition to leading, you, normally you would lead seven groups of pilgrims to the Holy Land every year. Seven to the Holy Land and four to other places like yeah. Lourdes and Fatima, Ireland, Poland, yeah. places like nice. that. Nice, nice, nice. And um, uh, we may talk about that a little bit later, um, but in addition to all that, you wrote this commentary. You did one on John as well right. some years ago. I think that's it? what we were on. Yeah last time, yeah. so it's about time you got another book yep, out here. it is. And it's a good thick one. Why did you choose Genesis? Because it's the first book of the Bible, and therefore I think it's the most important book of the Bible. Okay. Now it started actually for a more practical reason. Somebody asked me to write a Bible study because there's a dearth of materials. There's not much out there for Catholics if you want to lead a Bible study. And so I said, well, I'll write my own. So it was a simple Bible study that we used. Mm -hmm. Then we filmed the life of Abraham. I've also done nine documentaries in right. the last 20 years, right. all on about 16 countries I think we filmed them in. And we had to go to Iraq to film the beginning of Abraham's life. And then we went to Haran and Turkey and came around through Bethel and uh, 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 all through the Middle East filming his story. Did you get to go to Ur? Yes, went well, up to the top of the ziggurat and uh, went to the... What, wait, what's a ziggurat? That's a pyramid. Okay. It's the pyramids that, the, uh, that they built back in those days. They're stepped up 100 feet high and it was quite impressive. It's still, you can still go up it today. It's not, yeah. it's, it's eroded a little bit, but it's still there. And then the... Look, after a good 4,000 years, I'll erode. <laughs> you know, that's... They, uh, Saddam Hussein rebuilt part of it so you could still see what it was like and experience mm -hmm. it. But, and, and so after filming the whole life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in all these areas, I've been to all the, almost every site that Genesis mentions. 
And I said to my wife, you know, we should, because of well, I already had the Bible study ready and we've been to all those places, maybe, let's develop that into a book. Let's, mm -hmm. There isn't any. There aren't any. I, I looked. I don't think there's any Catholic commentary, standalone commentaries on Genesis mm -hmm. in the last 50 years or so. I, I couldn't find any. There yeah, are th sets. There's, th there's one um, by Bruce Vauder. Uh, called On Genesis. Okay. And I think he <clears throat> published that in the 70s, if I'm, yeah, because yeah. I remember that before, when I was in grad school. But you're right, there are very few. And if you're a Protestant, you've got a stack of commentaries on Genesis as high. Everybody's right. right commentaries. Right. Because everything's about the Bible alone, of course, right. for them. So. Right, right. So I say, this is a time for, the book is daunting. Mm -hmm. It's part of that big thing called an Old Testament, and it scares Catholics because it's so big and has names like Hezekiah and Zerubbabel in it. And why have the old when you can have the new? Right. So let's make the book of Genesis approachable. Let's make it a fun read. Mm -hmm. The biggest compliment I've gotten so far is from the editor at Ignatius Press. The number, she's been with them, I think, 40 years. Carolyn, her name is. And she said, I had a hard time editing your book. And I said, why? She said, I for kept forgetting I was editing. I got so engrossed in the story. Yes. Ten yeah. pages later, I'd, oh, I got to get the red pencil out. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest compliment I've had because um, I wanted it to be readable, even mm -hmm. a book that you can read aloud to the family. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, that's the whole purpose. The whole purpose was because I, don't, I knew there wasn't anything like this out there for Catholics mm -hmm. and because it's the beginning of everything. In a way, we could say it's the most important book of the Bible because every other book flows from that. It's the foundation for everything. Sure. And you don't have a New Testament without first this. So if I was on an island, I've thought about this a lot. If I was on an island and I could only have two books of the Bible, I'd like to know what, what your two would be. Mine would be Genesis and the Gospel of John. Mm-hmm. Because Genesis gives you the beginnings of everything, and John right. then ties right in. In fact, they both begin with, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They both have the same. You know, I, I, I'd never thought of that question. Um, I'd have to think about it. Um, but uh, the gospel would be Matthew. Uh, either Ma maybe Luke, but Matthew just because it's longer, and I'll be bored, so I need some longer book to read. <laughs> And the other one would probably be the book of Psalms. Psalms. Yeah, that yeah. Would I wouldn't want to have to make that choice. No, no, no. We, and we, thanks be to God, we yeah. don't. But, the, you know, w there are a couple of things that I would, you know, let people know. Uh, you are plenty aware of some of the more scholarly issues. Like, you know, th there's many of you who have studied the Bible even in high school probably heard the theory of the different sources of the book of Genesis. That there's a, the J author, the P, D, and E, and all that. Um, and you're aware of that, but you refuse to get lost in that. That you, you, you mention it, you're aware, you tip your hat to it, but you focus on what is the meaning of the text. Right. rather than centering on these very interesting theories um, that are frankly up for grabs among yep. scholars right now. And you focus on the meaning of the text. There's a lot of issues that you can get stuck in the weeds. You yep. can get lost in the weeds. And I didn't want to do that. I right. wanted to mention there's the documentary hypothesis that certain different authors wrote sections of those first five books and it wasn't written until maybe the fourth or fifth century before Christ. And therefore, it causes in many people skepticism because the farther you get away from the source, the less authoritative mm -hmm. it can be. Mm -hmm. And I mention it a page or two, I describe it, but then I also describe why I don't subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. And I quote some other good authors like Scott Hahn and um, John Bergsma and Brant Petrie, who have, by the way, a very excellent book on the Old Testament put mm -hmm. up by Ignatius Press, which I really enjoyed when I was writing this. And so I, I deal with a lot of those kind of issues, um, but I don't want to get stuck in the weeds because I know if I'm reading a book and there's a lot of that technical jargon going mm -hmm. on, your right. eyes glaze over and you say, you know, I'll pick this up again tomorrow, and then you don't. 
Yeah. I want people to keep reading. I want them to know about it, but not get stuck in it. What you do more thoroughly is connect the various verses and episodes of Genesis with material in the Gospels. And then you also make a lot of connection with rabbinic texts yeah. so that you see this in light of the living faith of Jewish people and the living faith of Christians so right. that it's not an academic exercise, but you are understanding these texts in light of the living faith of Israel and the living faith of the church. Right. And I found it exciting. That's one of the reasons I did that, because right. for me, it's very exciting to find these connections. First of all, with the Jewish aspect, obviously it was their book long before it was ours. Right. They've been here long before, and, and they were the caretakers of the oracles mm -hmm. of God, the, where there are older brothers in a sense, and God gave them the responsibility to care for these scriptures. Right. And then we inherited them 2,000 years ago, but they had them for a whole lot longer than that. So I'm interested in how they understood Abraham offering his son Isaac. How did they understand the six days of creation? Very interesting um, aspect. Then I also wanted to tie it in with the New Testament because the New Testament is full of the book of Genesis. Genesis is full of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And very seldom do people put those connections together. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, I, I find it very exciting. It's called typology and I don't want to scare people with big words, but it's where people, places and things in the Old Testament prefigure or point to the coming of Christ. So in other words, in Genesis, you may see things that are like the sacraments, salvation, mm -hmm. all these things in black and white. But once you, come through Christ and look back, all of a sudden it all turns into technicolor widescreen. Right. And it's it, exciting that a way. A classic example would be the bread and wine offered by Melchizedek, yep. where the New Testament understands Jesus as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. And of course he takes bread and wine and makes it the sacrifice of the mass by making his body yeah. and blood. Genesis 14, and I think it's only four verses. Yeah. And yet, that is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament because of Hebrews talking about Jesus. Jesus didn't come from the line of Levi or Aaron. He came, he's in the order of Melchizedek. So you say, who the heck is Melchizedek? You go back to Genesis and there it is. And Jerusalem has been a Eucharistic city from 4,000 years ago. Right. So Abraham representing the people of God brings a tenth of the spoils of the war. He gives a tithe and Melchizedek, the key, uh, the key King priest mm -hmm. comes out of Jerusalem bringing a very extravagant gift for those men, bread and wine. And the church has always viewed that as a symbol of a prefiguration of even a pre-incarnate Christ coming out and bringing mm -hmm. those gifts to the people of God in a sense, or Abraham who was going to, all of us came from the loins of Abraham, so to speak. So the, it's all full of those kind of images. The ark, Noah and the ark represents water baptism. They go through the, uh, the water and what's over top of them? A white dove at the end. And even in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, it says that those eight people that went through the water corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. So it's letting us know, even the scriptures let us know that those images in the Old Testament were meant to be understood as pictures prefiguring of what we're going to have fully in Christ. Exactly. And there's another area here too, I think, um, that you address rather nicely. Uh, in the modern world, there's been tremendous controversy about Darwin and biology and evolution versus the Bible. You take that on. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I actually start that way because it's what made me become a Christian. I was raised as a Baptist, but when I got 17, 18, 19, I thought about these things and I was very inclined to leave that religion of my youth. But it was thinking through these issues philosophically that kept me as a Christian and eventually brought me to the fullness of the faith in the Catholic Church. When you look at the two different possibilities, and really there are only two possibilities, Either there's, there's something has to be eternal because we can't even comprehend that everything came from absolutely nothing. Something is eternal. Either matter, time plus chance and matter, or a creator. Right. 
So you've got these two choices. Which one answers the questions? So I present it to my kids and grandkids. You're a detective. You have evidence. You have the evidence of the, of the world. You look out there. There's a real objective world out there. You can deny it all you want, but you still go through the door and not the wall. There's still a real world out there that you have to live with, even if certain philosophers try to um, object to that. And what best answers that? How did that get here? And then I look at myself and I look at you, Father Mitch. We have personality. We have something that's different from anything in the universe that we know. Even different than the animals. The animals Absolutely. also have a type of personality. Right. But there's a difference between our personalities and cows. Animals don't consider their future and have abstract thought. They don't create. They don't communicate. They don't have the kind of love that a man and a woman can have or even friends can have. We are made in the image of God. Therefore, we reflect those qualities that God has many ways. So when you look at the order of the universe and you look at our say mannishness of man or our personalities those two clues tell us which views of origins answer the questions to explain those two things mm -hmm. if you say it's only matter plus time plus chance and energy or whatever then you don't have an answer to that question because it makes everything got here by chance random you have no purpose and meaning in life you're only a little machine hormones electronics chemicals and someday the sun's going to burn up, the solar system's going to burn up, and we're all going to be gone, and it's all worthless. There's no purpose in it all. It's just a sick joke. Yep. And, but if you have an idea that the thing that's eternal is a creator, an artist, a poet, and he has, because of his, I like to say that the Trinity had so much fun together in eternity. They loved each other. They had humor. Obviously, we have humor. We're made in their image. They, had, they loved each other. They communicated. And it just bubbled over one day and they said, we got to make creatures like us so that we can share all this love and joy with them. And that's why we're who we are. That's why we have this personality character because we've been made in the image of God. Now, which one takes the most faith to believe? Mm -hmm. That a creator created us and therefore all the things that we experience have meaning and purpose because they fit or the other view that we're all just chemicals and machines. For example, when I go home, if I say to my wife, honey, I'm having a hormonal reaction for you today. She's not going to respond well. <laughs> because that, that, that's the atheist has to, that's really the atheist it has nothing more to say. Love is a Christian word. It's a God word. I can say love because it has something more than chemicals and hormones. It's something that's made, I'm made in his image to love in a real way. So when you take a look at those two different possibilities, which one takes the most faith to believe? I'm convinced it takes more faith to believe that we came from nothing and matter than a, than a God created us. As a matter of fact, I could see that there would be a hormonal reaction called that's related to anger. Yeah, <laughs> that would be her response. Yes. It would Bobby be an electronic head. reaction. The, the other thing, too, that is, I think, another side of how inherently um, uh, illogical it is to think that everything happened by chance. If that is true, that everything happened by chance, then your theory that everything happened by chance also happened by chance. Right. There's no logic saying, well, yeah, that must be true. No, it's just that by chance, I think it's true. I have electronics and electronic connections going on in the gray matter between my ears. Why should I trust that? And I've, I've met atheists who propose this, and I say, well, that's just, you know, your chance reaction, what, what you ate and other things that happened today. I said, no, no, this is logical. I said, yeah, but see, your reaction to that is also just a, you know, random chance reaction. Yep. And no, no, this is true, but... They yeah. live as though there's a God and it has meaning and purpose. They cannot live consistent with their own philosophy. No. No, yeah. no, they can't, they can't accept that their theory about random chance yeah. is itself necessarily, yeah. therefore, a random chance. It's like saying there are no absolutes, but right. that statement itself is an absolute. Right. So you exactly. contradicted yourself by saying there's no absolutes. Exactly. It's inherently problematic. The only philosophy, and I've 
after looking at this for a long time, the only philosophy you can live consistently with is the Catholic Christian philosophy because it answers who we are and what we are. It mm -hmm. explains, now another thing that we didn't mention about Genesis, why it's so important, because it also explains the problems in the world, war, disease, conflicts, all these things. Why do we have that in the world if God is good and created a good world? Because there was such a thing called sin and rebellion against God and a fall. Mm -hmm. And that fall caused those. And Genesis also in Genesis 3.15 tells us that God has a plan to rectify that. He's going to fix it. And that's he's going to send a, a woman and her son. And he's going to crush the head of the one who got it started in the garden of sin in the first place. So the book of Genesis not only tells us where we're coming from and where we're going, it also tells us why there's a problem and what's going to be done to fix it. Now, a lot of, I, I think a lot of us would find this a very helpful discussion um, to, to consider some aspects of the creation, uh, especially given the controversies that I think were raised up without needing to have been raised up. They could have been addressed differently, but I think that people put a lot at stake uh, in it unnecessarily. But that your discussion is very helpful there. But I also happen to know from our discussion together that one of your favorite parts of your book is the story of the binding of Isaac. Right. The Akida. Akida, yeah. Uh -huh. And that, you know, um, this is when Abra Abraham ties up his son for sacrifice. Yeah. What? I mean, I don't know how well your children behave, but why are you thinking about binding them up on an altar? Yeah, right. You know, I'm glad that you brought that up because most of the time I do interviews on this book, we never get past chapter three. Everybody thinks that Genesis is just about creation and the fall of man, Adam and Eve. But that's only three chapters. Genesis is 50 chapters. There's a whole lot in there. And, and I'll get to that Abraham thing in just a second, but just in a simple way, the first part of it, if you have these eight things learned you've got the whole book of Genesis. You can kind of put it in your shirt pocket. Creation, fall, flood, and the Tower of Babel. There you got the first 11 chapters. Creation, fall, flood, and Babel. Now the second half of the book, which is more than it's almost 40 chapters, is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. There you got the whole book of Genesis on your fingers. Sure. Easy. So I'm glad with that... A, with two free thumbs. Two free thumbs, yeah, exactly. So I'm glad you brought that up because most people, we get stuck just on those first three chapters. Right. But the stories beyond that are just unbelievable and the writing is exquisite. Those verses that you mentioned in chapter 22 are some of the finest written literature, I'm convinced, that's ever been written. The way that it is in such a short period of time just the, the two verses it says, and the two of them walked on together. That just elicits so much emotion if you put yourself in there, the two of them, father and son. That passage in ch chapter 22 is my favorite, I think, of the whole book of Genesis. It's the pinnacle. It's the last time God tested Abraham. After Abraham passed this test, he had it easy going from then on. God says, okay, now I know you fear me. After all that he'd gone through already, he said, now I know. But this is the first time the word love is used in the Bible. It wasn't for Adam and Eve. That was, you know, real love between those two. But the first time the word love, the Holy Spirit reserved it for this situation because take your son, your only son whom you love. Mm -hmm. And we see a father with an only begotten son who he's going to take to a mountain called Moriah to offer him up as a sacrifice. Now, anybody who reads that should go ding, ding, ding. It should ring a bell. What other father with an only begotten son takes him to a mountain in Jerusalem to offer him as a sacrifice? And all of a sudden, this typology we we're talking about just comes the beautiful technicolor. Take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him as a holocaust, a burnt sacrifice. First of all, I, I deal with that issue of the living sacrifice, having a sacrifice of human sacrifice. First of all, Abraham came from Ur, and they had human sacrifice there. They found, when we were there, we even went and saw these, they're called death pits, that the archaeologists discovered. When the king died, all of his retinue died with him. And there were some that had the king and the queen dead, and all of their servants were dead and laid out in a, 
a, a pattern around them so that they could join them in the afterlife. So Abraham was not unfamiliar with human sacrifice. It was part of his culture. I wonder if, you know, God knew, I'm convinced that God knew Abram wasn't going to have to kill his son and Abraham knew he wasn't going to have to kill his son. It was a test. And Abraham said to the servants, I'm going to go with the lad. We will come back after we worship together. Isaac says, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? The Lord will provide the lamb, my son. And the book of Hebrews said that even if he did have to kill his son, Abraham believed so much that that was the God's promise. He was not going to let him down. He'd raise him from the dead. Yes. So you've got this father bringing his only begotten son to offer him as a sacrifice. The, I wonder if God is not saying, you know, Abraham, you used to worship Nana. That was the God of Ur, Nana, the God of the moon. Right. You lived in a culture that had human sacrifice. Are you willing to do for me, your new God, what you would have done for him? I wonder also if God wasn't saying, you know, someday I am going to give my only begotten son for these people. Is there a man, even one, that would be willing to do the same for me? I'm not going to make him do it, but is there a man who would do the same for me? Yeah. And I it just, I go through those things. There's, there's several of the different layers that I lay out about exactly. what's going to happen there. But bottom line is, I, Abraham knew he wasn't going to have to offer a son. And God knew he was, what he was going to do because that ram was already there. But the typology goes, it, it continues because Abraham takes his son up the mountain and Isaac is carrying the wood of the sacrifice. You have to burn it. When I did the movie on Abraham, we actually built an altar and I put the wood on top and we started a fire and I had a real ram and we got the ram up there. It took five of us to get that ram up on top of the altar, which is another interesting thing because Isaac would have been a strong young man by now and his father's an aged man. And even the Jewish rabbi said that Isaac was a willing victim mm -hmm. because he could have resisted his father. He could have said, you're not going to tie me up. I'm not like, what are you talking about? You're going to burn me on this thing. But he ends up on the altar. There's no way I could have gotten that ram up on the altar by myself when we did this. Mm -hmm. Abraham could not have got his son who could carry the wood. He's a strong, strapping young man by now. Isaac had to be a willing victim, just like Jesus was a willing victim. Mm -hmm. And when Isaac went up, it said he carried the wood of the sacrifice on his back because he had to make a fire. Well, when Jesus went up there, what did he have on his back? He carried the wood of the sacrifice on his back as well. We know that Simon the Cyrene carried it, but John makes sure that we know the typology connection, that Jesus carried the cross too, just like Isaac did. And when they got there, the, the, and, and the, it was ready, to, the knife went up. He said, don't kill your son. And there's a ram with his head stuck in a thorn bush. What's Jesus' head stuck in? A thorn bush, a crown of thorns. The typology is amazing. Yeah. But then it even gets doubly exciting. The second time the word love is used in the Bible is of a husband in love with his wife. Think Jesus and the church. So Abraham, in a sense, has Isaac raised from the dead in the sense that he didn't have to kill him. Mm -hmm. Takes him back home. Once he's home, he says, you know what? My son needs a bride. And he sends his unnamed servant, at least in this story, he's not named, back to his own people in Haran, Abraham's family, to find a bride for his son. And 10 camels full of gifts went with him to give to the bride. The bride consents to come back and marry the son. It says that as she's coming, she had a veil in her face and she saw Isaac meditating in the field and they fell in love and Isaac married her, fell in love with her and took her into his tent. It's really a romantic story. It is. It, it is. is. It's wonderful. So here we've got a picture now of God the Father takes his son back home from Mount Moriah from the sacrifice and he says, my son needs a bride. So he sends his unnamed servant, the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have a name. He's, he's holy and he's a spirit. He's a paraclete, but he doesn't, he's never given a, like a name for him right. other than an, a servant. He's the, the servant, the spirit. And he goes back with 10 camels full of gifts. The Holy Spirit gives his gifts to whomever he wills to the church. Rebecca, the church, agrees to come back to the son and the son weds her the church, mm -hmm. and they fall in love. That's the second time the word love is used, of the son falling in love with his new bride. So the only begotten son, the father loving his only begotten son, second time, the son loving the bride, all a picture of Jesus Christ and God the Father and Jesus and the church. But it's all right there in the book of Genesis. All you got to do is dig around a little bit. That's yeah. why I love it. It's like, it's like finding a gold mine and digging and 
discovering the gold. One thing I, I don't recall that you had mentioned, but um, the rabbis do mention this. After the binding of Isaac, Abraham never, spe he never speaks to Abraham again. That's true. Yeah, I yeah, agree. I, yeah, I yeah, didn't know the rabbis said that, yeah, but you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, they, they don't talk again. They don't argue, but they don't talk. He said, Abraham, you did good. Go out and yep. enjoy your life. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, we have to take a little break. And uh, of course, if uh, you're interested to find out more about some of the pilgrimages that uh, get done, uh, it's the footprintsofgodpilgrimages.com. Footprintsofgodpilgrimages.com. Dot com, and you can find out about more about upcoming pilgrimages. We'll take a little break, come back and get your questions and comments, so please stay with us. to uh, recommend that you take a look at this commentary on Genesis. It's called Genesis, a Bible study guide and commentary. It's written by tonight's guest, Stephen K. Ray. It's item number 6815, 6815. It's available at EWTNRC.com. And then something else I want to mention to you, of course, you know, to, uh, we mentioned earlier, today is the Feast of All Saints. But tomorrow is the Feast of All Souls. And the month of November is dedicated in the church to praying for the holy souls in purgatory. And you remember a guest we've had many, many times. Uh, we call her the purgatory lady, Susan Tassoni. Uh, well, she's got a brand new book on purgatory that's written for children. And it is called New Friends Now and Forever, uh, a story about the holy souls. It's also at the EWKNRC.com, where it's item 30208. It's, it's a fun book, uh, reads nicely, and... You know, something that I, I said on radio today, i just like to point out to you, there's a perversion of All Souls Day that goes on in the culture. Notice how many people are fascinated with zombies. A lot of TV shows, TV series, movies, and they're showing all kinds of these old movies on uh, the movie channel. And then you also see a fascination with vampires. These are both antichrist figures about life after death. Because zombies are brought back from the dead, they're the living dead, but they try to eat your flesh so they can live. Whereas Jesus Christ, who is raised from the dead in glory, gives us his flesh so that we can live forever. Vampires try to take your blood. They drink your blood and make you into a vampire. Whereas Jesus Christ gives us his precious blood so that you become like Christ. And the world keeps putting these anti-Christs and anti-Christ figures into the media. And we have to remind ourselves that no, we want the real Jesus who is raised from the dead who gives us his body and his blood to eat and to drink so that we can have eternal life, not 
live in a, cosh, uh, in a coffin waiting for a crucifix or a silver bullet to kill us. So, Very let's good. go to a couple other questions that we might have. Let's start off with Thomas in the great state of Tennessee. Thomas, what can we do for you today? How are you, Father? Fine. Good. I have a question for Mr. Ray. You know, I've always wondered, Mr. Ray, if the problems that we see today in Israel and uh, between Israel and Hamas and Iran, if those problems are rooted in the story of Isaac and Ishmael in Genesis. Could you, could you comment on that? Yes and no, I would think, because the, the problem is Islam that we're seeing today with Hamas mm -hmm. and a lot of the problems is between the Jews and Islam. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, I dealt with this in the book too. The Jews come from Isaac and the Arabs come from Ishmael, mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. So they, they still were, uh, there was conflict between them because Abraham sent Ishmael away. But the Arabs didn't be, there was no Islam for another 600 years after, even after Christ. Yeah, Islam right. Islam didn't Christ, come until right. 600 years right. after Christ. So, so it, it's, all, it's a matter of fact, it would be almost 2,400 years. Yeah, 2,400 years. years. Arabs, after. And before that time, most Arabs were Abraham. all Christians. Before Islam came along, most of the Arabs were Christians. And there, there, there were a lot that were pagans. Yeah. And there were a lot that were and still are right. Christians. Yep. So I don't think that we can say that this goes back to Abraham, uh, Isaac and Ishmael, other right. than the nationalities, but certainly not the religious aspects of no. it. Yep. And, and, and I would add this, Thomas. Uh, I think that it is very important to see that when you look back in history, Arabs and Israelites rarely fought with each other. Right. There, you know, in the time of the Babylonians, the Babylonians hired Arabs as mercenaries to attack is, uh, Judah. So that happened in the, the 580s. Um, but you don't see ongoing wars. Mm -hmm. And the present war, it goes back to 1927 A.D., when the British had promised this piece of land called Palestine, it was called Palestine then, um, they promised Palestine to Jewish people that had settled there and to Arabs who lived there. And they found out that the British promised both of them their own country that happened to be the same piece of land. They found out in 1927, and that's when violence broke out in Hebron. And the fighting continued from then. Uh, World War II settled it down for a little bit, and then after World War II, both Arabs and Jews fought the British. The British left, and then they fought each other. Um, and that's been ongoing since the 40s. But this is not an ancient war, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't make that. And let me add this, too, just so we have it real clear. What Hamas did to the 1,400 Jewish people on October 7th, that was not permitted by Quran law. Mm -hmm. Sharia law does not allow warriors to kill children and women and the elderly, people who can't fight. Warriors, they can fight. But to, to kill the innocent and, you know, the, the, you know, beheading babies and all that evil, that's not allowed by Sharia law. Mm -hmm. This was a policy of Hamas and its leaders. They planned it. They executed it. And now the rest of their people are suffering the way those poor children, women, and uh, others suffered. Uh, this, this burden belongs to Hamas. Exactly. Absolutely. 
Let's go over to Lawrence, who lives in New Mexico. Lawrence, what can we do for you? Uh, I'd like to ask two questions, one of each of you. Uh, for Stephen, I would like to ask uh, about this um, uh, Footsteps of God. I really love the series, and I wondered why the 10th one wasn't done. I think it's a really good format. It's a good introduction to to a, a Bible study. And then for Father uh, Pacwa, I'd like to ask... Um, uh, the Scriptures and Tradition is another good program. It has um, a lot of anecdotes and background information, and it's very uh, presented in a very, very nice way, like a conversation. I like it, and I wondered if you would convert it into um, a, a kind of a series of a Bible studies, so maybe edit it. I really think it's both those approaches offer a lot for people that are just trying to learn the Bible. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take, uh, Steve, what you got there for well, thank the you very footsteps much. of God? Thank you very much for that compliment. Um, in the year 2000, I woke up in the middle of the night and knew what I had to do and presented it to Ignatius Press, and they said, let's get started. So it's been a 20-year project. So we've done everything from the beginning, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way through to the Apostolic Fathers. In 16 countries, we filmed it. The 10th th one is going to be Doctors of the Church, the first five doctors. The reason we didn't have it done yet is because right when we had it all planned to go, COVID hit, and that set us back three years, two or three years. Mm -hmm. Then I just had my knees redone. That took another year, and mm -hmm. I'm still recovering from that for a while. And so, um, and now we've got this problem going on in Israel. So th this one has been delayed by circumstantial uh, situations, but we still plan to get it done. And it's going to be the first five doctors of the church. And it's going to start, all of them start. Which with, ones are you going to cover? Name them. Um, St. Augustine, St. Um, Ambrose, A um, Athanasius, um, John Chrysostom, and Jerome. Okay. Those are the five I'm going to do. Because, okay. And um, I, I'm, everyone starts out new with the apostolic fathers. I'm driving a bulldozer through a field, knocking, making a road. And I'm saying that the apostolic fathers, these first bishops, didn't have a, a bishop's house and a church and everything. Right. So they had to hack their way, get it all started with a machete to get the mm -hmm. church started. And the doctors of the church is going to start with me driving a big ambulance. And the doctors are coming. And it's, it's going to be fun. Okay. It'll be a fun one. All right. We have another caller, uh, Steve in Oregon. What can we do for you? Yes, Father. I just wanted to know, in Genesis, are dinosaurs uh, in the uh, book of Genesis? They are not. Well, wait a second. <laughs> Hold on now. The word dinosaur is not in there. No, not the word. Not, well, they didn't have the word dinosaur. As a matter of yeah. fact, I, I just was listening to um, a, a commentator. Even uh, George Washington had never heard of dinosaurs. Huh. He died three years before the word dinosaur was ever used. I didn't know that. However, however, Steve, let me suggest this. In Genesis chapter 1, you'll see the English translations mention sea monsters. Yeah, right. Leviathans. Yeah, well, no, it's not Leviathan. That comes later on. That's later. Yep. It's the Taninim. And the word sea is not part of that word. It's just the monsters. And so they wouldn't use the word dinosaurs, but they have their own word the, of the Taninim that are these big critters. And they don't define it, but, you know, Israel is built on limestone. And it, it, it's not from the time of the dinosaurs. It's about 30 million years. That, that limestone in Israel built up 30 million years after the dinosaurs were gone. But they would, there are plenty of uh, rep, uh, reptile and other fossils found there. I suspect that they were well aware of it. And also, if you go to um, ancient Moab uh, near uh, Kerak, there are a lot of uh, uh, fossils that are, that are available there. And 
you know, I suspect that they knew of these big critters, but they hadn't identified them as dinosaurs, but they just called them monsters, taninin. Yep. Um, now, that's, I think, pointing towards it without, they don't speculate much on it, yep. you know, they yep. don't develop it, but it is mentioned there. It's also worth noting, you know, dinosaurs, of course, were one of the great wipeouts of life on Earth. Yeah. And there are, I think there are about seven or eight times that life was almost completely obliterated, uh, uh, usually because of volcanoes and such, uh, in that case, a meteor. But, you know, they were aware of, of things missing, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't know if you, you, have you seen this? They discovered a fossil of a serpent in Israel that had legs. I heard about that, yeah. I, I, I've seen the picture, and, and I've the, not seen the, the fossil. the implication is that the serpent in the, in the Garden of Eden had legs, and then after the curse, he had to crawl on his belly. Right. And eat dust. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised that, again, they may well have seen such a yeah. fossil. Yeah you know, imprint, because limestone, you know, would have lots of fossils in it. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I, I've, you can look it up online, and uh, it was discovered in 1992. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's kind of cool, it's got the hind legs of a lizard and short, very short forelegs. Father Mitch, you are a wealth of information. <laughs> I, I never get, the audience, I never get tired of talking with Father Mitch. <laughs> Thank is, you. This Thank is you. great stuff. But I always tell people, no wife, no kids, no money, <laughs> lots of time to study. It's just what I do. <laughs> I'm just coming into that stage now because our kids are all grown and we have 20 grandkids. And now my wife and I just downsized to a nice little house we remodeled just for ourselves. Nice. So now I'm getting more time to do that as well. Yeah, yeah, so. it's a lot of fun. You know, and the nice thing about having grandkids, when they start to leak, you can give them back. <laughs> That's one of the things. But um, I, I, I think, you know, when we deal with modern questions that come because we are and should study science. Right. We should. Yep. And learn more about, you know, the Big Bang Theory right. and, you know, on uh, various aspects of physics and dinosaurs and the other animals, you know, uh, and it's just fascinating. The, the way I address it here, but also with my grandkids, is that God, in, in a way, you can view it as he's the author of two books. Mm -hmm. And they can't contradict each other if he's the author of them. There's the book of nature. When we look at the earth, he created it. He's sustained it. He, so when we look at it, we're not finding things that contradict God. It's his book. The Bible is also his book. Mm -hmm. He's giving us a revelation. Of these. They, the two work together because they're both his books. They, they're both from the same author, in a sense, looking at nature and looking at scripture. So the two can't contradict each other. We have to understand how they work together. Yeah, and I, I think to look at Genesis as this inspired, poetic intuition about the nature of the world and the, you know, the, the origins of it. Uh, even the fact that in Genesis 1-3, it says, God said, let there be light. What the Big Bang theory points out is that the Big Bang was an explosion of, of pure light, light. Yep. that the whole universe was about the size of a, a, a softball, and but it was pure light with nothing else, and that explosion it was you know God created that the explosion makes everything, and they didn't understand the Big Bang theory. No, nope. I don't really understand. I don't it either. Right. But you know. It fits that, and again, it's an intuition, not a science book, right. but it allows us to study science. Wait, let's get to this other call, if we might, uh, before we run out of time. 
Joe and Ginny, uh, where are you calling from? Uh, hi, Father Mitch. This is, again, Joe and Ginny, Ginny Sosnowski. And uh, back in the day, 2000... Hi, 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 Father Mitch. This is Joe and Ginny Sosnowski. And back in the day, 2009, we were on pilgrimage to the Holy Land with uh, Steve Ray and uh, cool. Scott Hahn. And one thing that surprised us is that we had a tour guide who was a Palestinian Catholic. And I was wondering if you could comment on the status of the Palestinian Catholics considering the conflict that's going on in there today. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I, my friend, his name is Amr, and he, he is a Palestinian because he's lived on that land for hundreds of years, his family. He's an Arab because that's his main language. He's a Roman Catholic and, a Ro and an uh, Israeli citizen. And now he's also a Texan because he bought some land in Texas. So I like him better already. I know. I knew you would. So uh, if Amr's listening, hello to you. Amr Shahada, he's the best. And anyway, the, the Catholic people there, they are getting fewer and fewer because it's difficult for them to live there. The way I describe it is it is the only country in the Middle East where, the, where there's freedom of religion and so on, but it's still... Israel, uh, there's advantages, uh, disadvantages with the Jews. They're like a big rock. And then over on this side, their own Palestinian blood, the Muslims, are in a sense consider the Christians to be traitors because they don't get involved in the jihad. Yep. So you've got the poor little Christians less than 1.5%. That's not just the Catholic. That's the Orthodox and all of them together. And one, less than 1.5% of the population, like a small pebble, and between these two boulders, like right now, it's, it's the Muslim Hamas and it's, and it's Jews, and they're banging on each other, and the poor Christians are stuck getting squished in the middle, and they find it easier to leave and go to the West. Yeah, and, and when they go to the Catholic schools especially, they learn four languages from yes, kindergarten. Absolutely. They learn Arabic, Hebrew, English, and French. Yeah. They so they so, can go. They can. And they are so, the Christians, especially the Catholics in the Holy Land, really emphasize education. They say that's our only weapon. Yep. We don't have guns. We don't have these things. We have education. And in Nazareth, for example, they are, the Christians are the ones that control the hospitals and the schools. Yep. And they are some of the best educated the Catholics are. Now, in Gaza, the, uh, the uh, a lot of Christians were gathered. There, there aren't, there's not a big Christian community no, in under Gaza. No, a thousand, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were gathered, and they were a, a lot of them were a couple dozen were hit by a bomb, yep. and and died. Um, that was just last week. Yep. Uh, so they're the ones who are in Gaza are caught. The ones who live. In Nazareth. Yeah, they, and, they live a very nice life in Nazareth. Yeah. Uh, but th there's still conflict. Like our guide will say that you hear in the news that, oh, we get live in peace with the Muslims. He said that's not the way it is in real life. There's a lot of conflict between yeah. the two. And um, so you've got the, the Palestinian Arabs that live in Israel who are Israeli citizens. Then you've got those who live in the West Bank and Gaza, which have a different status. And their life is much more difficult. But the, but the actual Arabs, what, 1.7 or 8 million live in Israel and they're citizens and they, they have a good life. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, they're not what we'd call first class citizens. No, no, they're not. They, there's, no, a, there's, there's, there are some difficulties. Yep. Um, one's in the West Bank. That's a different story. There, and a lot of Christians, and it's important to know that there are Christian villages in the northern part of the West Bank that have been Christian since the time of the apostles. Right, exactly. You know, these are very old and... I still um, speak Aramaic. Some of them can yeah. still speak the language of our Lord. Yeah. And so these, these are, and a lot of them are Orthodox. Some are Melkite Catholic. Some are Roman Catholic. Um, but they also know that they have a lot more to, in common together as Christians than in, they do with the people in the conflict. Right. But, uh, you know, they get pushed out of their land on the West Bank. And it's not right. Yep. So uh, by, by the Israelis. So these are difficult, very difficult in the West Bank, but worse in Gaza. Yep. But we have to stop because we've run out of time. No. Thank, yes. I want to keep talking. I know. This is fun. But you can't. <laughs> this is uh, footprintsofgodpilgrimage.com is a place to find out about more travel. And the book we're discussing is Genesis, a Bible study guide and commentary by Stephen K. Ray. Item number 6815 at EWTNRC.
www.thebibleproject.com. Thank you so much Thank for you. being with us today. And may Almighty God bless you and all of you in our, our family audience, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we can bring you Steve and other guests only because the network is brought to, to you, you by you, keeping us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. That helps us pay our bills. God bless you and thank you.